Welcome to the first episode of our two-part webinar series titled, The Intersection of Traditional Medicine and Behavioral Health in the Latinx Community. This first part of the series is titled, Integrating Curanderismo in Behavioral Health, Addressing Body, Mind, and Spirit. My name is Maxine Henry, the co-director for the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center. I will be your host for today's webinar. Before I introduce you to today's guest presenter, here are some brief instructions about today's webinar. Next slide, please. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future playback. It will also be dubbed or closed caption in Spanish and eventually also in Portuguese. A copy of today's presentation will also be made available after the webinar to those who request it. The lines will be muted throughout the presentation so as to minimize background noise and other interference. When we get to the Q&A portion of our webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And I will present your questions directly to our presenter. We will also be asking you to fill out a brief survey at the end of this webinar. This satisfaction evaluation is important to the work we do and provides us the opportunity to improve our training efforts. Although we did not secure continuing education credits for this event, we plan to do so for future events. So let's begin. Next slide, please. Let us start by introducing the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center and our team. The National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center is housed at the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, located in New Mexico. NALBA was established to fill a need for a unified national voice for Latino populations in the behavioral health arena and to bring attention to the great disparities that exist in areas of access, utilization, practice-based research, and adequately trained personnel. The NALBA's executive director is Fred Sandoval. Our ATTC is part of the ATTC Network, which is an international multidisciplinary resource for professionals in the addictions, treatment, and recovery services field. Next slide, please. Established in 1993 by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, the ATTC Network is comprised of 10 domestic regional centers, six international HIV centers funded by PEPFAR, two national focus area centers, and a network coordinating office. Together, the network serves the 50 U.S. states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the United Virgin Islands, and the Pacific Islands of Guam, American Samoa, Palau, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and the Marina Islands. The international HIV ATTCs serve Vietnam, Southeast Asia, South Africa, and Ukraine. Here you will see a map of the U.S.-based ATTCs. The National Hispanic and Latino ATTC has a national focus for Hispanic and Latino communities and the workforce that provides services to these communities. Next slide, please. Our ATTC is staffed by Dr. Pierre Luigi Mancini, our project director, and myself, Maxine Henry, the project co-director. The National Latino Behavioral Health Association is also the home of our sister TTC, the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center. We will provide contact information at the end of this webinar. Next slide, please. Our esteemed presenter for today is Dr. Eliseo Cheo Torres, the Vice President of Student Affairs at the University of New Mexico. Since he was a boy growing up on the border of Texas and Mexico, Eliseo Torres, known to everyone as Cheo, has been fascinated by the folk traditions and folkways of Mexico and of his Mexican-American roots. Both of his parents were versed in aspects of herbal lore and healing, and as he matured, he learned from them a love and respect for the history and folk knowledge of the ancient art of curanderismo, or Mexican folk killing. Now, as administrator of the University of New Mexico, where he is vice president for student affairs and a member of the faculty of the College of Education, Cheo regularly lectures and gives presentations on the history and lore of curanderismo to audiences ranging from scholars and students of Latin American culture to people hoping to become knowledgeable about alternative and traditional medicine, including lay people and medical professionals alike. 
He has published four books on his life in and research on his subject area. The first one, Curandero, A Life in Mexican Folk Healing. Also, Healing with Herbs and Rituals, A Mexican Tradition. Thirdly, Curanderismo, The Art of Traditional Medicine Without Borders. And last but not least, Curandero, Traditional Healers of Mexico in the Southwest. All are available from the University of New Mexico Press and Kendall Hunt Publishing Company. Dr. Torres, we are so honored to have you with us today as our esteemed presenter. Please begin your presentation. Thank you, Maxine, for the wonderful introduction. And I'm happy that we're here with um, colleagues from all over the country. First, what is curanderismo? Uh, it comes from the word curar, which means to heal. Many of you are curanderos because you heal people. Also, curanderismo uses a holistic approach to healing, treating body, mind, and spirit. And you may wonder who is a curandero or curandera. And this person is a traditional healer working with what ties to body, mind, and spirit, which is working with the material, spiritual, and mental levels. And in earlier years, it was said that you had a dawn or a gift to heal. However, we all know that, that it takes training to become a healer. Uh, and our, also, it could be an, through an apprentice under a, another curandero that understands this topic. Or nowadays, you can attend schools like the Centro de Desarrollo Hacia la Comunidad, located in Cuernavaca, Morelos, Mexico, and run by a friend of mine, Dr. Arturo Ornelas. Now, what is the influence of curanderismo? There are seven influences that I'd like to touch on. The first one is a blend of Native American and Spanish roots. Uh, keep it in mind that the Spanish arrived in the New World or in Mexico in 1519, bringing them with, with them medicinal plants from Europe and rituals that they learned from the Moors uh, from Northern Africa. However, the Aztec natives in the New World all had also had their own traditional plants and rituals. Therefore, this was now the beginning of a fusion of both cultures. Influence number two is a Judeo-Christian influence, that it's a gift from God and a belief in God to do the healing. Many times the curandero or curandera may say, it is not me, but God that's doing the healing, and I am only an instrument of God. Influence number three is a Greek humoral influence, where there's an equilibrium or a balance of hot and cold, very similar to the Chinese yin and yang, and that in order to heal a hot illness, we use cold plants and remedies and vice versa. Influence number four is the Arabic influence, where there is a direct psychic energy. And we should remember that the Arabic Moorish culture from Northern Africa controlled Spain again for more than 800 years. And many of the rituals were barred by the Spaniards, including mal de ojo or the evil eye, caused by direct psychic energy or a stare at another person, also brought here to the New World by the Spaniards. And then influence number five is the African influence a santeria, African santeria blend of Catholic, with a blend of Catholic saints and African orichas. Keeping in mind that, um, that, that Afro-Caribbean islands like Cuba and Puerto Rico experience a lot of the traditional healing. And in a few minutes, you'll see two short videos of energetic cleansings or limpias from Cuba and Puerto Rico. Influence number six is spiritualism and psychic influence where spiritual trances and communications are with spirits. Uh, this um, influence was probably uh, happened through uh, Spain, I'm sorry, through uh, France actually, by a person by the name of Alan Kardec who studied spiritualism in France during the mid 1800s and considered the father of spiritualism my teacher, Chenchito, uh, channeled spirits uh, of El Nino Fidencio, and I write about Chenchito and the spiritualism and psychic influence in some of my books. And the last influence 
is a scientific influence where curanderos and curanderos know germ theory, psychology, and biomedicine. Here is my colleague, uh, Dr. Arturo Ornelas, that has collaborated with me for almost 20 years. He is the one that established a school in Cuernavaca, Morelos, Mexico, called Centro de Desarrollo Hacia la Comunidad. And he also, of course, addresses body, mind, and spirit in his school, which is a holistic school. In this um, webinar, you will be, uh, we, will get, we will begin with heating the body, and we will discuss plants for the nervous system uh, by Leticia. We will also experience fire cupping or ventosa, similar to Chinese cupping, but a little bit different. Uh, and also, I have combined mind and spirit into slides, uh, it also addressing the spiritual cleanses or limpias in Spanish. Laugh therapy called Risa Terapia. You will experience a sweat lodge or a temascal. And also, two limpias one is Af will be an Afro Cuban, and the second one, Afro, Afro actually, Afro Puerto Rican cleansing. We'll start here with the body. And the body, he, we have a slide with the famous curandera in Salvador, or masseuse Nelly Mancia from Cuernavaca, Morelos, Mexico, doing an acupuncture technique. I use this photo for one of my books. Now, for the first polling question, have you ever used a plant for treating an illness? So far, 92% of you have said yes. 9% uh, so far or no. So I'm guessing that most of you have used a medicinal plant for treating an illness. Here we have plants for the nervous system with uh, Leticia Amaro. We call Leticia Leti, but uh, she is from Mexico. Her interpreter is Dorita Gonzalez from Albuquerque, New Mexico, who trained in Mexico on being a healer. Now she has her clinic in the northern part of the city. And plants for the nervous system are very important. Uh, the benefits are many, uh, such as a sedative, calming nerves, plants for depression, anxiety, and insomnia. In the video that you're about to uh, experience, Letty it talks about the plants for the nervous system. Basically, a computer for your body. Todo lo que va a pasar en nuestro organismo se programa primero en nuestra mente. Everything that's going to happen in our body, we have to remember that first starts with our brain. Y las emociones van a tener suma importancia en todo lo que pueda pasar en nuestro sistema nervioso. And our emotions are super important to everything that happens within our nervous system. Por eso hay que programar cosas positivas. That's why we have to program it with positive things. Okay? En lugar de decir, ay, es que estoy enferma, instead of saying, oh, goodness, I'm sick, debemos decir, me siento bien. You need to say, I feel good. Estoy feliz. I'm happy. Okay? Este va a ser el mejor día de this mi vida. This is going to be the best day of my life. Vivir hoy. To live in today. Dejar sentir todas las emociones. Eh, abrazar. And to let all those emotions go and embrace them. Amo. Hug people and to love you and to enjoy. Día, va a ser para que se en this is going to be the best day for my body and so that I have the best conditions, the most optimum conditions for all of my body in every sense of the word. Hay enfermedades muy importantes que se dan en el sistema nervioso. There are a lot of illnesses specifically that work towards the nervous system. Una de ellas y la más común puede ser el insomnio. One of them that is very common and very, that affects the nervous system is insomnia. ¿Sí? Y eso tiene que ver con tantos problemas que tenemos durante el día que no los resolvemos. 
And those have a lot to do with a lot of the problems that we have during the day that we never brought resolved to. Y por la noche, en lugar de descansar, continuamos pensando cómo lo vamos a resolver. And instead of at night sleeping, our mind begins to think of how are we going to resolve the problems that we didn't get to during the day. Eso desde luego, desde luego cansa. So then we get, mente, our mind gets tired. Y nuestro cuerpo se va a sentir. And our body starts to feel por la falta de ese descanso necesario. For the lack of the necessary rest. Otras enfermedades importantes es, por ejemplo, el Parkinson. Another important disease that we would look at is like Parkinson's. El Alzheimer's, ¿no? Maybe even Alzheimer's. Un terrible este, padecimiento crónico. Those are all that develop chronically. Que pasa de ser de crónico a crónico degenerativo. Que yeah. nos hace olvidar todo. It helps us go from whether chronic to genetic chronic, which we get to a point where we forget everything. Entonces es muy, muy importante mantener nuestra mente sana. So it's really, really important for us to maintain our health and our mental health. Siempre con un pensamiento positivo. And we can do that first, starting with a positive thought. En este caso, la maravillosa naturaleza, nuestra madre tierra, for, for this, the marvelous mother nature, nos da plantas excepcionales can give us exceptional plans para mantener a nuestro sistema nervioso este, trabajando como debe ser. And this helps us to maintain our nervous system so it continues to work the way it needs to. Tenemos, por ejemplo, la lavanda. For example, we have here lavender. Esta planta que con su aroma, this plant with its aroma, va a tranquilizar mi sistema nervioso helps to tranquilize our nervous system. Va a servir para cuando se siente uno muy nervioso o tiene ansiedad. It helps when somebody feels really nervous or has a lot of anxiety. Simplemente con tener un ramito cerca. You could always just have just a stem. Y percibir el aroma. Perceive the aroma. Yo me voy a tranquilizar. And I naturally become more tranquil. Otra planta tranquilizante. Another tranquilizing plant is. Es la hermosa rosa. Is a beautiful rose. ¿Sí? Aparte de observar su belleza, but apart from looking at its beauty, su aroma también va a relajar the al cuerpo. Aroma as well helps to relax the body. Una planta sumamente importante, one plant that is very important, que tienen aquí, pero a mares, you guys have a lot of this here. Es el maravilloso romero. It's the beautiful rosemary. Esta plantita es Un hepato protector. This is a blood protector. Hepato regenerador. It also helps regenerate. Y es una planta estimulante. But it's also a stimulant. Que aparte de su aroma, and apart from its aroma, yo puedo de este, diariamente, I could daily, comer una hojita. I could eat one leaf. ¿Sí? Y esto va a mantener a mi cerebro, and this would help maintain my brain, despejado. So that it becomes, there's fluidity. Sí. Va a ser excelente cuando hay problema de ansiedad. It's really excellent, excellent when people have de problems of anxiety or depression. En una depresión estamos como que ya no tenemos aliento, no tenemos deseo de seguir viviendo. When somebody has depression, they lack their breath and they no longer have the desire to go forward. Nuestra energía está bajando demasiado. And their energy has become very weak. Entonces esta plantita es estimulante y me va a ayudar a recuperar esa energía. And so this plant is a stimulant and it helps recuperate your... The next um, presentation is by Rita Navarrete and it deals with fire cupping called ventosas. Ventosas are similar to Chinese cupping with a difference of what we call running ventosas that you will see in Rita's following demonstration with its benefits uh, being mobilizing the blood flow to promote healing, uh, attacking the digestive problems, uh, uh, reducing stress, anxiety, and pain. And now you will see Rita doing a demonstration of fire cupping or ventosas. Lumbar region. Nosotros vamos a, a tratar de explorar siempre we will try to always explore el cuerpo, the body. Y aquí lo que vamos a hacer es una práctica. And here we're going to do, we're going to show you a demonstration de ventosas calientes, of hot fire cupping. Es muy, muy despacio, it's very slow and gentle. 
you want to make sure that when you're um, lifting the cup that you break the seal with your finger. Pasamos la ventosa. We would pass the cupping in la in la zona de músculo in the muscle area. Vibrando la columna along the sides of the, uh, the spinal column sin tocar los discos without touching the spinal disc. Because basically what we're doing, what we know is that muscles contract because of the lack, the way that they become uncontracted is that there's no blood flowing to that area. So what the ventosas do is they pull that blood and they force it to go there so that when you have a contraction and you remove the ventosa, it naturally relaxes. Just please pick up the Y nos va a ayudar a, a calentar el músculo. It helps us also to warm the muscle. De una forma muy profunda. Of a way that's really deep, that you can reach the depth of the muscle. Va a activar circulación. You activate your circulation. La presión que ayuda pressure a levantar el músculo. That helps to lift the muscle. Nos favorece. Helps us. Well, so we have a couple, we just saw a couple of demonstrations of treating the body. In addition to body treatments, I've combined mind and spirit for demonstrations of spiritual energetic cleansings called limpias, not only from Mexico, but also from Cuba and Puerto Rico, and a little bit of laugh therapy and the Temascal sweat lodge demonstration. Have you ever received a spiritual, a spiritual cleansing or a limpia, cleansing of mal de ojo or susto, etc., or the treatments? Yes or no? It looks like it's pretty equal. Uh, 47 of, of you have received some type of spiritual cleansing or, or su, uh, for susto or mal de ojo, and 53% haven't, haven't done this. So it's a fairly equal. Thank you. Here we have uh, Laurencio Nunez from Oaxaca, Mexico, doing a demonstration on me on a spiritual cleansing or limpia, and the benefits are many. Uh, Laurencio uh, uses uh, several elements for his limpia, such as an egg, herbs, copal, incense, candles, water, or mezcal, can also be used to absorb and sweep negative vibrations. In the following limpia, Laurencio will use only two elements, plants and eggs, for his limpia on me that you will see. Vamos a pasar a hacer una demostración. I'm going to show you a demonstration right limpia. now of how we'll do a cleansing. Vamos a pasar a hacer una demostración. Vamos a llevar a cabo esta ceremonia de limpia en el cuerpo, en el pensamiento, en el espíritu y en el corazón de tu hijo, Che. Que así sea. Allow me to bring cleansing to his body, to his spirit, to his mind. Vamos a pasar a hacer una demostración. I'm going to show you the demonstration right limpia. now of how we'll do a cleansing. Quiero demostrar el plan celestial de llevar a cabo esta ceremonia de limpia en el cuerpo, en el pensamiento, en el espíritu y en el corazón de tu hijo, Che. Que así sea. Allow me to bring cleansing to his body, to his spirit, to his mind. Por favor, in the heavens and the earth. Ayuda los gran seres. Help me, great Father, with these great plants to help with this Mother Nature that we climb so that I can cleanse this body, este those thoughts, este espíritu, that spirit, este corazón, and this heart of your son, Eliseo. Help him a sacar todas esas malas vibraciones. to take out any bad esas vibrations, energías que se cierran en su cuerpo. those energies that feel that they can stay Cuídame in his body. Protege. 
Everything that you're looking for, that's the palabra. way it is, and that's the way it'll be. Help us, great Father, so that this the rain, rain, with the strength of the Mother Earth, be an element that can guide us and help the body in their thoughts. El espíritu is the spirit el corazón de tu hijo che. of the heart of your son, Cheo. Help us, great father. All of our parents, y take care of him and protect him. Que este huevo that this egg absorba absorbs las malas energías, any bad energies, las malas vibraciones, any bad vibrations, any sad. Well, you saw Laurencio doing a, a short demonstration of a limpia. Uh, we'll be seeing Laurencio next week in Oaxaca where we take a group of students from the University of New Mexico for two weeks um, visiting with, with Laurencio and many other healers from Oaxaca. Now we talk about laugh therapy briefly. Uh, this is Risa Terapia and some of the benefits to, are to increase natural painkiller cells such as endorphins to suppress the stress hormone of epinephrine, to help the cellular immune system, and to exercise the lungs and circulatory system and bring oxygen to the blood and, and finally to reduce stress and anxiety. A demonstration of laugh therapy will be done by me after this end of the seminar actually with a TED Talk presentation. The next uh, demonstration is on a temascal or the sweat lodge, which provides context for symbolic healing. It, it helps to create a cohesive sense of self or a transformation, if you will. It provides a basis of, for cultural identity development, a meaning to experiences, promotes group solidarity, family cohesion, uh, re, re, stress, a stress reliever. In Mesoamerica, it's used as a curative ceremony to purify the body. And now it's being recovered in Mexico, South America, and the Southwest that cleans the body, mind, and spirit. In fact, it's making a comeback in many countries. It releases toxins through, of course, sweating, and moves the lymphatic system through exfoliation. I'm a great believer in the Temascal and use it frequently. Here are some examples of some sweat lodges. On the top left is one in Oaxaca that we will experience, a group of students and myself next week. This is by the ocean. And bending on the students here is the curandero you just saw recently, uh, Laurencio Nunez. Uh, he's also a temascalero. On the top right-hand side is a temascal outside of Albuquerque. 
On the bottom, or it's the same Temascal that was created here by my friend and colleague and healer Tonita Gonzalez in the northern part of Albuquerque. What's unique about this Temascal on the right bottom hand side is that it has a bench. Not everyone can sit on the floor, so for people that have knee problems, you can sit on this bench. And behind the flowers or the rocks that that heat this temascal, they're volcanic rocks. I uh, would like to share with you a demonstration of a temascal run by uh, uh, Rita Navarrete. But first, have you ever experienced a temascal or a sweat lodge? Yes or no? It looks like about 19% of you have and 82% have not. I hope that one of these days you can come to New Mexico to experience this wonderful uh, technique of a temascal. Hello, my name is Eliseo Chero Torres and I'm an administrator and professor at the University of New Mexico. And this is part of a film, a series of films to explain what traditional medicine of Mexico in the Southwest is about. And today's program is very unique and exciting. It's about the Temazcal or the Mexica Mexican Sweat Lodge of the Aztecs and the Mayans. This topic is making a revival, not only in Mexico, but also in the Southwest. Here in Albuquerque, this is one of the newest Temazcals in the North Valley of Albuquerque. Temazcal was built by Torita Gonzalez, whom you will hear from in just a few minutes. And we have today uh, a person whom you've seen already on film, Rita Navarrete, who is a temascalera, a person who specializes in temascals. And she also will be explaining a ceremony first uh, before we enter the temascal or the sweat lodge, a ceremony to the four directions, a ceremony to the altar that you will see in just a few minutes, and what it all means. Everything is significant and everything will be explained. And I know you'll enjoy today's program. Thank you. Good morning. I'm here with you to share our traditional medicine. It's an honor for me to be here explaining the importance of this for us. To start with the presentation of an altar. This circle represents for us the Mother Earth. Pero también la importancia de que estén en la semilla. But also what is really important here are the seeds. Porque representa la trascendencia de las generaciones. It explains the how our heritage has transcended. Pero también el pan de cada día. But it also represents the bread of every day. A polling question, are you familiar with, let's go back to, uh, you know, I apologize, we, um, the, um, the video is not showing, but it is an excellent video on a Temazcal and the experiences inside a Temazcal. However, we did get a, a, a good description from Rita and Tonita on the Temazcal. Uh, the next polling question, are you familiar with Afro-Cuban traditional healing of the following type of healers? Uh, a Santero, a Babalao, a Palo Monte, or a Curandero? If you will check um, as many boxes as, as you have experience with. It looks like most of you have experience with a Santero and then Babalao and then Monte, uh, Palo Monte. And 90% of you have experience with Curandero. That's excellent. Thank you. 
Well, you know what? We jump to the. Uh, ex- We did see the demonstration at the Mascal, and we just placed it in the wrong area, but you did see that, and you've already answered the questions that pertain to this slide, which is Afro-Cuban healing. This ritual demonstrates an Afro-Cuban energetic spiritual cleansing called Olympia, using the elements that you find in Cuba, such as cigar smoke, plants, coconut, and rum. What is the effectiveness of Olympia? Well, it strengthens the spirit through a spiritual cleansing, disposing and leaving negative energy inside the circle that you will see in just a minute. And also it honors Mother Earth through this cleansing by using plants, cigar, and a coconut. Wow, vencedor, which is like a really uh, important, um, is like this music, a lot of ceremonies we do, we have your vaccines and we have uh, maravilla. The three of them are like it's a very typical uh, cleansers. These are the plants I'm going to use today. And the three of them are very good for cancer. Uh, some of them, like uh, Maravilla, is like an invasive plant. Maravilla, Maravilla is a plant that there are like different types, different colors. All of them have different uses in our tradition. A lot of these plants not only have like a spiritual purposes, not only have like the type of cleansing that we use, like mental and spiritual, but also they have like medicinal uh, powers. Maria, Maria, for example, not many people know it, but the black seeds are very good for prostate cancer, for different prostate conditions. Esta hierba fina, que es una hierba para baño lustrales también, para limpieza, para sacar la agua afuera, pero esta hierbita cuando las personas sean una herida, le gusta que tiene las hojitas porque esta está muy chiquitita, está muy finita, cuando sea una herida, que empieza a botar la sangre que está en medio de cualquier lugar y no, y no pueden pararla, con dos hojitas de esta mata, se pone una aquí, una aquí, en cubre, le pone el dedo y enseguida la sangre se debería. Hierba fina es usada a lot of times, so, por ejemplo, cuando tienes wounds, es like a good, es um, very good to stop the blood. And it's used like sometimes in situations where the person get it. You just uh, saw Olympia by Pedro Palacios from Havana, Cuba, with his apprentice David Hernandez, a follower of Cuban Santeria. Pedro from Cuba is considered a Babalao healer, Santero, a Palomonte practitioner. We appreciate um, Pedro's demonstration and he has invited us to Cuba and we may take him up on that. What, these are the next polling questions. Are you familiar with Afro-Puerto Rican traditional healing? Yes or no?
Well, it looks like um, only 15% are familiar with Afro-Puerto Rican healing and 86% of you are not. So this is an excellent uh, demonstration for those that are not familiar with Afro um, Rican, Afro Puerto Rican healing. Uh, this ritual demonstrates the following ritual actually demonstrates an Osain spiritual cleansing by Dr. Yasamur Flores. Uh, the benefits of this ritual is that this cleansing uses Vencedora plant that you heard of, about in the Afro Cuban demonstration. However, he also uses red and black fabric symbolizing life and death. Negative energy is pulled and transferred to the black fabric while positive vibrations are trapped into the red fabric, signifying life enveloping death. This limpia that you're about to see creates a new crossroad of life, prosperity, beauty, and blessings. And here is the demonstration by Dr. Yasamur Flores. And now, you break those leaves, and then you cut. I got a tiny cross because we are forcing the four corners of the universe to evil. So no evil can come to her. And the reason you do this is because you don't want to leave anything behind that can also hurt or harm you. You can see that life is wrapping around all the negativity. It's a life affirming process. I'm gonna ask Abby to turn around. And now you're gonna come and you know come over like that. Okay, now you go to that side. Okay, turn around again. Okay. Let me uh, also add that Dr. Flores comes from three generations of priests, his mother, himself, and his son. In the Lukumi Afro-Caribbean traditions, uh, he just demonstrated an assigned spiritual cleansing, and we want to thank Dr. Flores for this excellent demonstration. How do you learn more about curanderismo? traditional healing. Of Mexico, the Southwest, and actually other countries, they may use another name other than curanderismo, but the, the basic concept is the same. Let me tell you about a free Coursera class, and this is how you enter. The, in the center of this slide is a page that you may want to Google to find out more about this free class. And when you, when you enroll for this class, do audit the class, if you want a certificate, there's a small cost of about $39. But if you don't want a certificate, there's no cost. The first class was just um, presented uh, beginning in January. It will be starting again in July. And this is traditional healing using plants. Here you learn about preparation of plants, either dry or, or, or fresh plants for tinctures, which is a water, actually alcohol based and microdosis, which is water-based, where they, we also discuss jugotherapy or just juice therapy. We develop herbal oils using medicinal plants and other techniques. And then the second class has already um, been shown, but will be repeated later. And this is traditional healing of the body, such as empacho, which is intestinal blockage. We talk about dry empacho, and wet empacho, one causes constipation, the other one causes, uh, causes diarrhea. Mantianas, which is a gentle massage using um, a cotton cloth, and this is very effective with pregnancies. Actually, a curandera can 
turn a bridge baby using the Mantiadas techniques. Also, it's used for the elderly uh, and for children who are, it's a special population. And then Ventosas, you saw a demonstration of Ventosas. We teach Ventosas more in detail. And so Adores, which who were the original chiropractors before the profession was recognized as a profession. And then on the bottom, we have Curanderismo, traditional healing of body, energy, and spirit. Here you see a photograph of Laurencio Nunez, who you saw in his demonstration. In this um, class, we talk about different types of limpias or energetic spiritual cleanses. We also discuss the Temascal in detail, uh, healing grief through Dia de los Muertos, and healing through sound and music or vibrations. And then on the bottom left-hand side, you have global and cultural influences of traditional healing that is being offered right now. We say it starts May the 6th, but you can also you can register right now and finish the course in plenty of time. Here we talk about traditional healing from Puerto Rico and Cuba. You saw some short demonstrations. Uh, also traditional healing from Africa, from the countries of Uganda and Gabon mainly. Uh, healings from Peru, and, and two or three classes on Mayan culture heal, healing. And again, let me remind you that these courses are free, and they're online, so you can uh, take them at your leisure. They're fun classes and very informative. However, what if you want hands-on, if you want to come on campus, you're more than welcome on July the 8th through the 19th. This is at the University of New Mexico. We have a class called Traditional Medicine Without Borders or Curanderismo. It's every day, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 12.40 p.m. It's a long morning, but it's a very fulfilling morning where we have all sorts of demonstrations and healers from Mexico, from Guatemala, from Peru, and from other countries that will be coming and doing demonstrations. We have in the afternoon, that's in the morning, in the afternoon, we have hands-on techniques where you can practice. And if you don't want to take the class for credit, you can take it for non-credit to continue an education. We're pretty open because we want the community to experience this. If you are in the health field and you need continuing education units, we can do that, working through continuing education. It's a fun class. I invite you to come to the class so you can stay in the dormitories. We have plenty of space in the resident halls in the summer, or you we find your other housing or close by hotel. So I hope you can consider joining us at the University of New Mexico this summer, again, July the 8th through the 19th. We've been doing this class for 20 years. Here are some of the texts. Some of you are wondering, what, where do I read more about, about uh, curanderismo or traditional medicine? The first one here the book is called Curandero Life in Mexican Folk Healing. It's a series of personal stories on my path to traditional medicine. I talk about my teacher, Chanchito, Crescencio Alvarado, and the Fidencista movement. Uh, and then the second book is a, a book pretty much about plants and rituals, and it's a good reference book. And here I discuss three curanderos that I call Los Tres Grandes, or oh, you see their photographs on the right hand side on the top is the famous Don Pedrito Jaramillo who lived in Falfurias, Texas. Uh, he is a healer that was very popular in the late 1800s. He died in 1907. And we talk about his contributions. The middle photo is the famous Nino Fidencio who died in 1938. He healed the president of Mexico, Plutarco Elias Calles, and became quite famous after that. He lived in the, in the town of Espinazo, Nuevo León, Mexico, where I've spent many, many times there with my teacher, Chenchito Crescencio Alvarado. I discuss the Fidencista movement and how it's still alive and well all over the country, both in the U.S. and Mexico. And then on the bottom is the famous Teresita, and all three curanderos, uh, Don Pedrito Jaramillo, Niño Fidencio, and Teresita, are considered saints, folk saints, not canonized saints, but saints of the people. Teresita came from Sonora, Mexico, to Chihuahua, Mexico, <clears throat> at a young age of 16, 
Uh, her teacher was the famous Curandera Huila. Uh, she became so popular, it scared the president of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz. He exiled Teresita out of Mexico and she went to El Paso, Texas, uh, doing a lot of healing in El Paso, then moved on to New Mexico. And then Clifton, Arizona, where she spent a lot of time. From there, she moved on to San Francisco, started working for, for a pharmaceutical company of St. Louis, Missouri. Wound up in New York City, where she married a gentleman by the name of John Van Order. And then she moved back to Clifton, Arizona, where she died and is buried. All three curanderos are, are wonderful, and they set the basis for what we know today. And then the third book is Curanderismo. It's my, one of the recent books. It's a textbook for the online classes. Uh, it's published by Kendall uh, Hunt Publishing Company. And all the classes that we talk about are in this class with additional information and research. And the final book is Curandero. It's, it's a book of the history of curanderos, or curanderismo, and photos of some of the curanderos that have passed on and some that are still alive. What I would like to do now is to share with you a TEDx talk that I did recently on, on some of the things that have been dear to me, uh, some of my passion for traditional medicine or curanderismo, some of the herbs that I use like the aloe vera, the papaya, some basic rituals for problems, and susto or magical fright as sociologists call it. I also discuss a proposal for a new health model that combines traditional with modern medicine and demonstrations that I mentioned on one of my slides on laugh therapy or Lisa Terapa that I mentioned earlier um, on the slide with Rita. Rita is one of my teachers. So here is the TEDx talk. This is not juggling. This is called misdirection. <laughs> My passion is curanderismo. I study, I research, I write about it, and I teach a course every summer on the topic. How many of you have been to the course? Some of you, I see some hands up. So you know what it is. Curanderismo comes from the word curado, which means to heal. A curandero is a male healer a curandera, a female healer. And think about this. In earlier years, there were few medical doctors, there were few ministers, priests, no counselors. So the curandero played all these roles using a holistic approach to healing the body, mind, and spirit. Now, my mom was not a curandera, but she should have been one. She would tell us, all six of us children, she would say, don't you dare get sick. <laughs> and if you do, I'll take care of your illness. And she did. Using medicinal plants, using rituals, she kept us healthy. I'll give you an example. She loved the aloe vera plant, savila. And she would call it la plantita milagrosa, the miraculous plant. And she would say, this plant heals everything from pimples to wrinkles. Indeed, she used it on her wrinkles and on our pimples. But she also used it for burns and sunburns. And my dad had serious digestive problems, so she gave him papaya. Every day, she gave him papaya for breakfast. And she would ask us, please take your papaya, eat your papaya. Of course, you know how kids are, we didn't eat papaya. Until recently, I was diagnosed with diverticulitis, and the physician said, you will need surgery. So immediately I got on the phone, I called Rita, my curandera friend from Mexico, I said, Rita, I'm having surgery. She said, no, you're not. She said, take papaya. 
<laughs> Three times a day if you have to. I said, that's what my mom used to say. And she said, did you listen to your mom? Mother always knows best. And then, and then there were those wonderful rituals. For example, the ritual of the seven knots in Spanish is called El Rito de los Siete Nudos. How many of you have problems? Come on, all of us have problems. In this ritual, it was amazing how the curanderos used simple things to deal with serious illnesses. All you need is a ribbon, a red ribbon, about a foot and a half in length, and you think there's seven problems, and if you think you don't have seven problems, you do. <laughs> you take the ribbon, you take the half, half of the ribbon, and you tie a knot for your first problem. And you think about your problem, and you can pray to like Move a couple of inches to the right, you tie your second knot for your second problem, and then you go to the left, and then to the right, and to the left, and to the right, until you get to the seventh knot for your seventh problem. So you've already tied a circle with seven knots. You take the ribbon with the seven knots and you find an empty jar, like an empty peanut butter jar or a mason jar. You put your ribbon with your knots in the jar. You close it, go to the backyard. Be careful the neighbors aren't watching. They think you're digging money. So you, you dig a hole, you bury the jar with the ribbon and the therefore you get rid Isn't that interesting? Very simple. Now, this reminds me of another ritual a friend of mine told me. He's a curandero. He said, when we were kids, my dad was an alcoholic. And he would come home and he would insult us and he would curse at my mom and we were miserable. But there were times that our dad would come home and he would go to the backyard and we would sneak behind him and we would hide in the shrubs. And then he would lie on the ground, lie on his stomach, and he would take out his pocket knife and he would dig a hole. And then he would curse at that hole and he would yell obscenities at that hole and then he would cover it. And then he would come home and he would be as sweet as ever. What was he doing? What was it that he was getting rid of all that anger, all that stress that's in a lot of us, all that garbage that sometimes we need to get rid of in a very simple way. And then there was the ritual of susto, which means fright. Sociologists refer to susto as magical fright. Whenever you have a traumatic experience, an accident, maybe a fire, or maybe you come back from a war, you may be suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I remember my cousin came back from Vietnam and I'm sure he had PTSD, but I don't even think we had a label for it back then. And he would have, he would have flashbacks, he'd have migraines, he'd have suicidal thoughts. And my mother and my aunt said, he's got susto, susto pasado. It's, it, it's a serious susto. So what they did is they took plants, just not any plants, they took basil, they took uh, rue and rosemary and they swept his body from head to toe three times in prayer. And I remember they would whisper, may the spirit of Juan return to his body three times, three times a week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for a month. And they asked us to be part of the rituals. The neighbors would come in support. At the end of the month, my cousin was normal. Isn't it amazing how these wonderful things have it can, can cure a person. Now, my belief is that we can create a new healthcare model that will bring both traditional medicine and modern allopathic medicine together. In fact, I've seen this model work very effectively in Mexico at a place called Sedet. Centro de Desarrollo Hacia la Comunidad, or a Human Development Center. It's really a school for curanderos. And hundreds, if not thousands, of curanderos go through that school. And usually, it's a certificate program that lasts about three years. I was there about three years ago, and I had a terrible pain. I had sciatica. I could hardly walk. 
And one of the curanderas, who's also a professor there, said, Cheo, what's wrong with you? I said, well, I have sciatica, and I've had it for years. She said, can I work on you? I said, of course. So she said, first, we're going to a Temazcal, which is a Mexican sweat lodge. And we did for about an hour. And then she gave me a herbal tea. And then she said, take a nap. She wrapped me in a, in a blanket. And, and I napped for about 30, 40 minutes. Afterwards, she worked on my leg. She massaged, she pulled, she stretched. And after about an hour, an hour and a half, she said, go to sleep. I slept like a baby. The next morning, not only was I walking, I was running. And I have been pain-free for three years, so it's just incredible. <laughs> at, this, at this school, SEDEC, they teach curanderos that are actually the doctors of their villages, things like healthy lifestyles, diet, juice therapy, acupressure, acupuncture. They make their own medicine with herbs. They make tinctures in alcohol base. They make microdoses with, with the water base. And they teach last therapy, visa terapia. Did you hear me? Last therapy. Now, Nino Fidencio, a famous curandero in the 1920s, was already doing last therapy. And now Rita, my friend Rita Navarrete, does last therapy. She teaches last therapy, even here at the University of New Mexico during the summers. Now, I think Rita has already realized that last activates endorphins, the natural body painkillers, and it suppresses epinephrine, the stress hormone. It also helps the immune system. It circulates the blood. It relieves anxiety. And I'd like to try an exercise with you that she taught me. Would you please stand, all of you, for a second? Now, I want you to go along with what I say, OK? Start by saying, he, 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 he. <laughs> now, OK, now, hey. <laughs> now, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> now, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> now, if any of you were experiencing pain, you will be pain-free for the next 30 to 40 minutes. <laughs> I'm serious. Going back to the model, let's dream big and let's bring both forms of medicine. Now, we're beginning to do this at our own University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center, thanks to Dr. Artie Prasad, who has the Center for Life here. Yes. But this has to exist all over the country, in fact, all over the world. And I'll tell you, this is what we need to meet the needs of those that are uninsured, especially those 11 million immigrants that live here. The only time they go to the hospital is when they're really sick and they go to an emergency room, which is overcrowded and understaffed. So let's come up with a new model and stay healthy. Eat papaya and laugh a lot. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, the webinar and the um, the TEDx and uh, Maxine uh, will now uh, have some some comments and, and some questions for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Torres. That was such an amazing presentation. Um, during your presentation, we have been receiving quite a few um, questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the questions to you. And then anything that we do not get to by the end of our time for today, we have about 25 minutes. Um, what we will do, everyone, is we will post any follow-up answers to unanswered questions um, on our website, and we will give you the contact information for that. All right. You ready for all your questions, Dr. Torres? I'm ready. 
<laughs> Great. Um, first up, Eric Esquivel asked, is there any correlation with curanderismo and treatment or identification of mental health conditions? Uh, curanderos do deal with mental health. Um, it's very effective using the temascal, and also there are some plants that are used for mental illnesses. Um, the temascal, we, we did uh, the work with the curanderos and they built a couple of temascals in northern New Mexico to do, deal with um, uh, addictions and alcoholism and mental illnesses and it seemed very effective. It was under a grant. Uh, unfortunately, the grant uh, stopped, uh, it ended and the project ended. But I believe that there, this has a lot of possibility um, for future research and for future funding to see how effective it can be and how economical it can be. Great, hopefully, yeah, hopefully some of those things will emerge again, especially with more of this information getting out there. Uh, thank you. All right, so next question. Alex Santos wants to know where the rituals which were shown on the first video, where do these usually take place? Well, they, if you're working with a healer, it could take place in your home or in a healer's clinic. <clears throat> we um, we do many demonstrations during the two-week class. The online Coursera class has these uh, demonstrations and many more, but it could happen anywhere. We have a health fair in conjunction with our two-week class, and we do a lot of these rituals outdoors in public. We call it um, not a health fair, but a fiesta de salud, because we have fun. We bring music to this health fair. And um, so again, it can happen in a curandera's clinic, if she has a clinic or in somebody's home, or we teach people to do their own rituals. And sometimes people change those rituals and that's okay as long as it's effective and there's a good intention involved in these rituals. Great, I love that you continually go back to the positivity that is really kind of woven into every single piece of this traditional healing. You know, you're bringing music into these fiestas. You're calling them a fiesta, not just a, a fair or um, a gathering. And, and so that's great. All right, the next question is a little stacked. So I'll ask you kind of one piece at a time. Alfonso Rodriguez Lines asked, do we know what percentage of the U.S. Latino population use curanderismo practices? We don't have that data. It, it, it's difficult to get the data in the U.S. because there's not that many healers, trained healers. If you were in, in, in Mexico, Central America, South America, I would say a large number of people still use traditional healers uh, because of uh, traditions, because of customs, and because of cost. In this country, there's not that many. We are now training a lot of allied health people to considered uh, incorporating traditional healing into their practices, and it's working very effectively. Uh, it's going to be a different model here in the U.S. as, as you find in other countries. Uh, in Chinese, it's, uh, it's pretty well known that you combine traditional with modern medicine. In India, the same way. In this country, we're attempting to make a difference. It's just going to take time, I believe. Great, so kind of more part of that integrated healthcare that is starting to emerge. That's correct. Great. Um, the same um, individual asked, have any representative surveys been done on curanderismo? Um, we've, we've done some surveys. This summer I'm working with Dr. Tom Chavez from my psychology department and he will be doing some focus groups and some, some studies. Uh, we've done some things, but not enough. That is, uh, I think, our weakness that we need more, more research and more clinical um, research uh, to show that this can be effective. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done in this area and more surveys. I'm encouraging a lot of the students here especially doctoral students to consider this as their dissertation or master students to do some research for their thesis. So I think it's gonna happen with time. 
Okay, great. Have any randomized clinical trials been done that you know of? That was a question from Antonio Martinez, so but kind of along the same lines. Unfortunately, very little that I know of. A lot of work was done in the 1960s, and then it, there was a pause a little bit in the 70s, and now uh, it's a revival, so there's more interest. There's been two or three doctoral dissertations that have been done, uh, so I, I believe that um, in the near future, we should have more uh, people involved. The Health Science Center here and at the University of Minnesota has been very active, and so I think that we'll begin, we'll begin to see some changes here soon with some, uh, some surveys. Great. Um, Elizabeth Coronado asked, what was the name of the plant that was shown right after the lavender in the first video? I believe it was rosemary, uh, romero. Uh, rosemary um, grows very well here in, in New Mexico because of the climate. But uh, rosemary um, is being now used for memory loss. Um, it's just a wonderful plant uh, that you can also cook with rosemary or romero. And that's, those are the two plants that she emphasized, uh, Leticia. Other plants, she, she uses other plants, but those were the two main plants, um, uh, lavender and romero or rosemary. Great. Um, so if we were going to use rosemary, do we buy it fresh? Do we buy it dried like in the spice aisle? You can buy it both uh, fresh uh, or you can grow it. It's easy, easy to grow. You go to, to a nursery and buy romero and grow them. I have romero all over my home. It has a wonderful fragrance. Um, a lot of pregnant women uh, post to postpartum bath with romero water. It's, and, and they have some really uh, sweet dreams and uh, very effective. Um, to, to do a hair rinse with Romero, also if you have uh, dandruff, it's very effective. But Romero is just a wonderful plant. And of course, uh, I use it in my cooking with fish, especially in chicken. Great. So more than one use at a time. That's correct. <laughs> um, Becky Stout asked, can you please remind us of the purpose of a limpia? The limpia is to uh, sweep away or absorb negative vibrations. Um, we are composed of energy, and the belief is that energy is damaged when you have traumatic experiences. So the limpia will, um, you, the, the plants supposedly sweep away, this is not just any plants, there's certain plants like rosemary that I just mentioned, uh, albahaca or basil, ruda or rue, um, they are other plants that are mostly aromatic plants. They use these plants to sweep away the, the negative vibrations and in, in a chant or a prayer or a song. It, it, the, the rituals vary from culture to culture. And or they use an egg. The egg absorbs, instead of sweeping the negative vibrations, absorbs any negative vibration. Um, a friend of mine um, who passed away, Elena Avila, a well-known healer who was a registered nurse by profession, called this limpia a soul retrieval. And the belief was that you have, when you have a traumatic experience, you lose your soul and you retrieve your soul by doing a limpia. Uh, you can do all, she also used uh, eagle feathers sometimes to do the limpia, the native culture uses feathers. And, and, and during this process, you would retrieve back your soul. Remember when Laurencio did his demonstration on me, he was calling out my name, will the spirit of Cheo return to your body? That's a soul retrieval concept that Elena has published uh, in her book, um, and I can't think of her or of the book's name, but um, Woman Who Glows in the Dark is a book, and she writes about the soul retrieval concept that she promoted. I, I hope this answers your question on the limpia. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so as you're speaking about soul retrieval, there was a question from Sonia Boyd. She asked, do you have to believe in this in order for this to work? 
And as a kind of a follow up to that question, some of the comments that were being made in the chat box were, uh, which I kind of formulated into a question. Um, do you feel that traditional healing and religion are mutually exclusive? Well, going back to your first question, you have to believe it helps if you believe in this. Um, but it, that's true in allopathic medicine. If you believe you're going to get well, most likely you will get well. If you don't, then you won't. The belief system and faith are important in this, in this concept. Um, and as far as the church, um, this is all positive. Uh, I, you know, if you start you know, promoting black magic, then the church may be against this. I, I don't believe that, that you will find any, anything wrong with the church uh, um, accepting this if they understand what the attempt is. Uh, there's prayers in this. In fact, my teacher, Chanchito, many times would tell people, go to church. You've got to go to church. You've got to pray. You, you, you've got to be a, a, an example to your family uh, that you believe in, in, in an, a, a super being. Um, in God. Uh, so church is part of this and, and, and prayers are part of it and the faith is a part of it. However, if a person doesn't want to use religion, then use energy. Instead of the soul, you use energy and you're, 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 you're healing your energy that's been damaged. So it just depends on the person. Okay. Makes sense. Um, want to go back real quick to the question about um, herbs or plants. For the treatment of PTSD, you mentioned three plants, basil, rosemary. Can you remind us of the third one? Um, there's different plants. It could have been ruda, rue. Rue is a very popular plant. It's a very strong plant. Um, ruda, basil, and um, uh, romero or very popular. And there's other plants like California pepper tree, which is called pirul. Uh, Nino Fidesz used a lot of pirul plants. Uh, and that's in the limpia, if a person may have PTSD. PTSD is serious, and there may be a different type of cleansing called uh, uh, espanto or susto pasado which was, I talked about my cousin having PTSD coming back from Vietnam, and his treatment was more severe than the basic PTSD. Yeah. Um, his was done for a month, and it was susto pasado, because he wasn't treated early, so it became serious. And they, it's amazing how the curanderos have different levels of limpias for, for different conditions. Okay. okay. Um, after, do you, can we make a list of the herbal remedies available to the participants? Definitely. I will send you a short list that I have already, and I'll also send you a description of, of uh, Susto and um, Limpias, and it's a one sheet that I will send to you, and you can certainly um, uh, uh, pass it on to uh, our audience. Great, thank you. And also, if, they, if you want more information, there are the textbooks that, that have the description of the plants. Um, the first, uh, or one of the books that I mentioned, uh, Healing with Plants and Rituals, I've got the name of the plant in English, in Spanish, and the botanical name with a scientific name, and also the, the usage in medicine of these plants. I've got maybe 150 plants that I've compiled. And if you really are interested in, the, in plants, uh, the class, we have several of the top herbalists. One is Tomas Enos, Dr. Enos is from Santa Fe. He specializes in plants. We have Doris Ortiz coming from Mexico City. He also specializes in plants. We will spend a, a, a day at the botanical gardens with some of the top herbalists from the area doing herb walks and then two demonstrations at the, herb, at the botanical gardens on how do you prepare these plants. So we, we place a lot of emphasis on medicinal plants. Great, okay. Um, how would you recommend, or is there any way to differ differentiate between uh, quote unquote real curanderos and quote unquote fake curanderos? Uh, I believe so. 
sometimes it's word of mouth, uh, finding out if they know what they're doing, and also uh, the fees that they charge. If they start charging a large amount of money, be careful and, and you know, be cautious. Uh, curanderos that I work with, don't charge or charge whatever you want to donate, and it's a donation. When we bring the heaters uh, uh, to the class uh, and we have treatments at the health fair, we have a box and people can donate whatever they want to, if anything. So um, you, you, I think you can tell, we don't have that many you know, healers that have devoted their life to healing in this country. But uh, the healers that we work with are, are very legit. They've been to school, to the school that I mentioned, many of them. And uh, they're just wonderful people and just wonderful friends that are out there to help uh, humanity and people better their lives. And you know what? You don't really need a healer. We tell people, you be your own healer. These techniques, there's, there's nothing to them. You can learn them and you can become your own healer. Heal yourself and heal your family. That's what we're telling people. You don't need a healer, to, to be honest with you. Right, so you're kind of, you know, really giving the power back to the community. Um, so, Naomi Velasquez, or Noemi, I apologize, Ms. Velasquez, um, she wanted to know if in your teaching, do you all take into consideration and discuss the traditional people that originated all of these um, practices as a way to honor them, um, especially for those who have worked so hard to fight for the protection of these practices? Yes, we do. Actually, the class starts with year 1519 when the Spanish arrived to the New World. And then we, we track some of the famous healers like the, Los Tres Grandes that I mentioned earlier, Nino Fidencio, Don Pedrito Jaramillo, and Teresita. And there's other healers that we've studied and honor those healers. Uh, one of them who just died last year was my teacher, Crescencio Alvarado, called Chinchito. Uh, he had quite a following in Mexico and also in South Texas. Uh, so we, we honor his contributions, his traditions, we write about these healers. So we, yeah, we, yes, we honor and respect uh, the traditions of, of our ancestors. And, and now we're creating new healers that are incorporating a lot of the traditional healings into their own practice, which is wonderful. Uh, curanderismo here is not the same as curanderismo in, in, in Mexico, Central America, and South America, because it's, it, you know, we, you have access to modern medicine, to allopathic medicine, but you can certainly, uh, it could be an option and you can certainly incorporate this into your profession or you become your own healer um, a lot of people remember their grandparents and their grandma, how she was used to heal the family. And, um, but unfortunately, very little was written or studied back then. Now we're beginning to study that and appreciate all the knowledge that our ancestors had and how effective a lot of their treatments were. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that, you know, that was kind of coming up a bit with regard to watching the videos of some of these healing practices. And it was really great to see the participants of the webinar discuss like, oh, yeah, typically these are very protected and private events. I believe that we're just watching videos of them as a, as a demonstration. Um, and then to hear, you know, the fact that you are honoring the tradition and the indigenous communities who who did fight very hard to get these um, two families so that they can heal themselves. Thank you for that. Um, Myra A. asked, how can we use traditional practices with families with ADHD, depression, and substance use in youth between 10 and 18 years old? You know, I've created these on, the online classes for that purpose, for people to look at these videos, for them to understand the history and the practice and the rituals and the plants. Uh, so I think uh, we can teach young people. I lecture at the high schools, at the junior highs here, uh, so that uh, students will start understanding and appreciate, appreciating traditional medicine and empowering families to, 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 to heal their own families. And, and 
you, you never know, as uh, Andrew Weil, who is a guru of integrated medicine, says, if it doesn't hurt, it could help. So why not try some of these things? As long as the intention is good and there's no harm done to the patient, then it, it could be very effective. We work very closely with the Native American communities here, with the different Native American pueblos. And so we're bringing the curanderos into the pueblos and they're sharing their their traditions and their rituals uh, with one another. And some of these uh, Native American heaters are now are going into Mexico. So we're bringing people together now to, to share. Uh, we, we brought the Ugandan heaters here from Africa. It's amazing how much similarities they had in their traditions and their plans and their rituals with those that we know of here in, in, in this country. Great. So a bit of diversity in that class as well. Um, do sweat lodges separate males from females? Some of them do. We, when we offer our sweat lodges, we'll have sweat lodges for women. We'll have sweat lodges for men. And we'll have community sweat lodges where we bring both together, both genders together. Their energy flows differently, male and female. So sometimes it's kind of nice to have both of them in a, in a sweat lodge so that their energies sort of come together and blend together. But, but we offer both. The dynamics are, are different in the genders inside the sweat lodge. Okay, great explanation of that. So can Tamascals or sweat lodges, um, have they been proven to be successful for individuals living with substance use disorder? We believe that they have. We, we used them in, sub, in a substance uh, abuse clinic uh, in northern New Mexico for a couple of years. The problem is that we didn't do a lot of clinical studies. Uh, we ran out of money and that stopped the, the research. You know, so the weakness is that we don't have a lot of research, but there is an opportunity for the future. Uh, we all believe that it's very effective uh, and we've seen this, but we haven't really researched it as much as we, we should. Okay. Um, let me see, what else do we have here? Is sage ever used in rituals? Yeah, definitely, yes. Yeah. Sage, Native Americans use sage for clean scenes, uh, especially white sage. Uh, but sage, yes. Copal is used more than sage. Copal is a resin coming from the copal tree in the um, in a lot of the rituals, but sage is very much used by the Native Americans and also by a lot of the uh, Latino Hispanic healers. So yes, it is part of the healing. Thank you for that. Well, we have many more questions, but our time is running short. As promised, we will work with Dr. Torres and his team at the University of New Mexico to get as many answers to the rest of the questions as possible. And we will go ahead and make them available um, and other resources available via our websites. So we would really like to thank you, Dr. Torres, for today's presentation and all of the invaluable work that you do for our communities. On this slide here, you will find the contact information for the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC. You can reach out to us for more information about all of our projects and to request training and technical assistance in your area. Additionally, with that um, contact, you can um, stay tuned for the recording of this webinar, as well as any additional resources and answers to the Q&A portion that we did not get to. Um, think this here is the contact information for Dr. Eliseo Cheo Torres. So if you have follow-up questions specific to the work that he does, he has so generously uh, shared his information with us. Thank you again for joining our webinar series, Integrating Curanderismo and Behavioral Health, Addressing Body, Mind, and Spirit. We would like to invite you to the second half of our series that is uh, titled Understanding Latino Cultural Health Behaviors and the Role of Women. This will be taking, pla taking place on Tuesday, May 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and it is also 90 minutes. 
if you will kindly complete the evaluation at the end of this webinar, um, as soon as you this webinar ends, you will be redirected to our evaluation. Again, this evaluation and your feedback is really important to us. We do want to hear uh, what you thought about our presentation today and how we can continue to provide excellent trainings and technical assistance to you. Thank you, Dr. Torres and your team. Thank you to the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC. Thank you to NALBA and thank you to all of our participants. Enjoy the rest of your day.